Metroid 2 is an odd beast. It is the only game in the mainline series that Sakamoto wasn't involved in, and is considered by many to be the weakest of all of them. It is both very important to the series' progression, and yet also takes a backward step in terms of the series' counter-conventional attitude. This can be seen in the game's much more linear structure and focus on killing baddies. In light of the remake, Samus Returns, and the fan remake, AM2R, Metro 2 is very likely to fall by the wayside in the minds of fans. But to me, there is an edge that Return of Samus has the remakes don't. Replaying the game for this series of videos, I uh, was not prepared for how hard it would hit me. But now I know why Sakamoto would find such inspiration from this game and carry its spirit forward and go on to create the masterpiece Super Metroid. Metroid 2's story follows on from the first. Dealing with Mother Brain didn't eradicate the potential threat of the Metroids, so the Galactic Federation send in Samus to the homeworld of the Metroids, SR388, to essentially commit a xenocide. Her mission is to eradicate the entirety of the species so they would no longer pose a threat to the peace of space. Now, I'm not sure if it was because of the lack of Sakamoto's guidance or not, but I think this is a game that you could point to and say, yeah, this was made in the image of the film Aliens. The similarity of the two stories is quite easy to see. The heroine goes on a mission with the aim to eradicate an alien species. You're going out there to destroy them, right? Not to study, not to bring back, but to wipe them out. That's the plan. You have my word on it. All right, I'm in. The Metroids have also been brought up to the more alien code, and have multiple forms that are birthed from eggs and advance through development, molting into stronger forms. And as both stories reach their climax, the female protagonist has to fight a queen alien and in the end rescue and bond with a child in a very maternal way. So in many ways, Metroid at this point is still being defined by an other, but it is slowly coming into its own. On the gameplay front, following on from its predecessor, Metroid 2 sets up some things that the series continues to have. Some of these are born out of technical limitations like the Varia suit, and others are more purposeful like the space jump, spider ball, and being able to shoot down while jumping. The environmental storytelling of Metroid 2 is quite excellent, and would be an enduring part of the series to come. In Metroid 2, it is used to heavily imply that the Chozo are the creators of the Metroid. And also lays down some neat world building where the tougher creatures in SR388 exist closer to the Metroid lair, since they have to contend with the tougher forms of the Metroid. And yes, I'm aware, much of that you can attribute to, you know, general gameplay difficulty progression. But it can also be both things. So, you know, please chill. But anyway, again, like last time, this is not the correct path we must take to fully appreciate Metroid 2's legacy. And unfortunately, there are like, no interviews for the creation of Metroid 2, but we do have this little tidbit from Sakamoto about the game. I think I may have discussed this a little bit in my GDC speech, how I was very moved by the last scene in Metroid 2, and that stimulus became my motivation and inspiration in creating Super Metroid. I spoke in the first video about how Metroid was girl boss, and that it was a little bit contentious. Now, I want to follow up on that because I was trying to apply that term's general vibe with the meta-narrative of Metroid 1's creation. But with Metroid 2, I think you could begin to apply it to Samus's growth as a character. Now, the term suggests that, hey, you as a woman can be a boss too. What this leads to though is women just being part of that damaging capitalist machine and adopting the hustle lifestyle where you prioritize being a boss and earning money over everything else. That is part of the reason why it's a little bit contentious and why this meme exists. 
and you can look up the etymology of that meme on your own time, it's not exactly relevant to this video. So what Metroid 2 does on a narrative level is actually address that. Samus begins the game following orders with the intention of straight up eradicating an entire species and then, at the end, realizes that, uh, wait a minute, just because this is what everyone else does, maybe it's not the best call? The very moment this happens is upon the hatching of the baby Metroid. The mindless girl boss attitude gives way to, you know, actual thought and reason, and Samus chooses life over what she has been told to do. On the meta level, this is also the point where Metroid as a series no longer defines itself by external forces. Mario and Alien, but actively builds upon its own legacy. In Aliens, motherhood is expressed in a very human-centric way, and that's understandably so, but Metroid's ending breaks away somewhat and does this in an interspecies manner. Being a parent is a profoundly impactful experience, or so I've been told. Now, as someone who is not a fan of children, I am obviously not speaking from experience, but I have, you know, listened to, read, and otherwise have been subjected to the media and messaging of parents, and there does seem to be some level of consensus that it changes you. Your priorities shift, and your meaning in life or whatever is now defined by this new life. In Metroid 2, Samus begins the game as a thoughtless killer, but right at the end, that perspective changes when she becomes a mum. I believe that is why, in another separation from Aliens, instead of some kind of tense, explosive escape sequence, Metroid 2 chooses to issue it for what is essentially a pleasant jaunt back to the spaceship. In the official remake, Ridley comes in to rule the party and offer a cinematic finale, and in AM2R, we have a more zoomed out perspective that allows you to see the beautiful environments, with the Metroid being smaller as well to focus less on the two. Though both of these examples have their own benefits, I think they miss the point of what Metroid 2 absolutely understands. And that is that this moment is about Samus becoming a mother. The tighter perspective that is forced upon the rest of the game is leveraged here to now provide intimacy and focus on just these two characters. The way the mechanic of the space jump works makes it seem like Samus is dancing with the Metroid, and the backdrop of the twinkling stars invokes the feeling of limitless potential for this new life and this new relationship. When I decided to make videos on this series, I made a choice to stick to the original games. No remakes, no fan games, and I'm really glad I did, because the remakes, though fundamentally better games, none of them I think quite capture that moment Sakamoto spoke of like the original Game Boy version. And playing Metro 2 after having read this, I absolutely get it. And I don't know if he felt exactly like I did, but I can absolutely imagine how playing this and seeing what the medium was capable of in terms of expression would motivate him to come back to the series and make it specifically about Samus and her very human struggles. So yeah, that's Metroid 2 in terms of a narrative analysis. What a nice short video. I love these, they're so much easier to edit. Now I have all this extra time to ask you guys things like, how are you going? I'm super excited for Metroid Dread, by the way. Are you? Please, if you are, let me know by smack- Surprise! I'm also going to be talking about Super Metroid in this video, and even though that's not really much of a surprise, given the fact that I gave it away in the thumbnail, the timestamps, and the Sakamoto quote, uh, and maybe even the title, we'll see about that one. We're gonna push on anyway, okay? Now, first, Super Metroid is, to me, the best game ever made, okay? So, I have essentially a thesis level video that I want to do at some point. So, for this video, I'm going to narrow the focus and speak on specifically what Super Metroid does in terms of 
that maternal narrative that was set up previously. If Metroid 2 provided a means to convey the feeling of a new mother, then Super would tackle what it would be like to feel loss, and it does not wait around. Super Metroid takes place right after the events of Metroid 2, and involves Samus dropping off the baby Metroid at a research station, only for Ridley to come in and take it. The rest of the game has the player scouring the entire planet of Zebes again in order to find the new base of the Space Pirates and track down the baby Metroid. I'll go into more detail on how the playable parts of the game convey this feeling of loss, but I want to go above that for a little bit because games are technically more than just what is playable. The opening title sequence is part of the game, it's part of the software, and Super Metroid uses this thing to convey that feeling of loss. See, other than just setting the mood, an interesting thing happens if you try and skip it. No matter how hard you mash or what button you press, upon opening the game you always have to see this screen. Even if it's just for a second, you are forced to view the baby Metroid and hear its cry. A reminder of your ultimate goal while playing the game and being lost in the labyrinth of Zebes, but also so indicative of how the mind works in relation to loss. Losing a loved one, or heck, even misplacing an item, your mind flashes with the last interactions you can think of of it. The present, of course, colours your perspective, alters the reality of what was. It's the same here. This image can't be real, at least not in Samus' eyes. When Samus saw the dead scientists, the baby was already gone, but she remembers it being there in better times, and so those two images are fused together. Now, diving into the planet proper, Lost can be seen in many places. For instance, after landing on the planet, the first place Samus goes is the old ruins of the Space Pirate Base, a memory from the original game, a reminder of the loss from the side of the Space Pirates. Later on, we also get, for the very first time in the series, an actual visual indicator of the losses the Galactic Federation had on this planet before sending Samus in. Additionally, the bosses in Metroid are always a pretty big deal, and there are four that you need to defeat in order to unlock Turian and face off against a mother brain, each one itself a shrine to loss in some way. Kraid is a direct connection to the past of Metroid 1, but also a reminder that things are different now. The space pirates you knew are no longer. Fantoon hits upon similar themes, but is a literal ghost that must be defeated in order for life and activity to return to the wrecked ship. Dragon might not seem connected to Loss until you defeat her, and then much care is given to show that Samus has taken a life in this world, and that her loss has beget more. Ridley is of course the instigator for all of these events, and is directly tied to the loss of the baby Metroid, but alas, his defeat only serves to offer up one final challenge. Playing the game as a kid, I always wondered why all of the bosses were fused together into this thing. Now you can view this as an homage to Metroid 1, which also did the whole statues of bosses that you need to defeat in order to get to the final area, but I think, like everything else in Super, it is used here with a bit more purpose. Like Metroid 1, they could have been separate statues, but are instead fused into a singular golden shrine, as if to say that the final challenge is an amalgamation of all of these bosses, all of this loss in one being. And so we land at Mother Brain.
I'm skipping over that thoroughly excellent scene with the baby because it's not exactly relevant to this video. Again, thesis, etc, etc. The encounter with Mother Brain holds all aspects of each of the other main bosses. Although Ridley is the one that physically took the Metroid, ultimately that act has to fall on the leader, Mother Brain, who happens to be the matriarch of the Space Pirates. To Samus, she is a ghost of the past that has come back, and also has a second, larger and much more dangerous second form. A reminder that things are different now. This battle goes like all of them do. The dodging of attacks and damage being indicated by flashes of the sprite. That is until Mother Brain employs a weapon that all of Samus's skill and weaponry can't defeat. Helpless, she waits for the final blow until the baby comes back to save her, as if it remembers its real mother. It attempts to heal Samus, but while it's doing so, Mother Brain begins to recover, and comes back with a vengeance. And still helpless, Samus can only watch on as the baby is killed. See you later, buddy. One last thing I want to get at before we finish off that scene is wrapping up the loss that permeates the game. One of the things that is synonymous with grief and loss is the five stages, and they are, in one way or another, mostly all present in the game proper. Depression is sort of just the general mood, you know, isolation and all that, but we'll get to that later. Denial can be read in the opening title sequence and in the game's opening on Criteria as Samus revisits what is essentially Metroid 1, but retreating to the past is not enough. Things have changed. And progression eventually leads to bargaining, where the deaths of bosses are offered to a golden shrine in order to move forward. Jumping back into this finale then, and we have... Anger. For a while, I always thought the Hyper Beam was just a cool thing. Its depth mechanically fun, but in light of the various interviews and quotes I have read now, I think there is much more to it than just that. To me, the Hyper Beam is the game's way of expressing the power of the rage of a mother scorned. When hit with a Hyper Beam, Samus loses all of her ammo. Why? Why is the hyperbeam obtained right after the baby's death? Also, if any of you had the idea to just settle down and, you know, chill at this point in time, you might have paused the game to find that all of the other beams are gone, consolidated into one. All of the neat strategies of swapping beams for different neato effects is replaced with one singular focused, devastatingly powerful force. You have no option for planning or thought because someone who is enraged has no such thoughts. And what better way to convey that level of single-minded focus than to remove all attack options into one beam. Heading back into the action and you will find something spectacular happening. Landing a blow with a hyper beam has this incredibly satisfying whiplash effect on Mother Brain. The game up till this point has indicated damage with a mere flash of the sprite. But here, the force of rage is so profoundly powerful that it needs the assistance of the physics engine in order to convey it. This is how you use game language. This right here is why Super Metroid is lauded as one of the greatest of all time. All of this loss and then rage, none of it is conveyed with a face or with words, but with mechanics and game design.
The ending of Metroid 2 moved Sakamoto to such a degree that from that point onward he knew exactly what this series would be about. It would focus on Samus as a human being, but in these two games specifically, as a mother. Super Metroid deals with the grief of a mother who has lost her child, and though the entire game is pretty sad, it ends on a moment of triumph, with that adrenaline still in the system. An indicator that you're still alive, despite all the stages of grief, denial, depression, bargaining, and anger. It is triumphant because at least you're still here, and so you must move forward. Yeah, 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 okay, I was doing that on purpose, okay? For those who weren't paying attention, I only mentioned four of the stages of grief, and that is because Super Metroid takes place in too short a span of time to really tackle depression and the fifth stage, acceptance. So you'll have to join me next time where the adrenaline rush of revenge has subsided and we are left in the cold of Metroid Fusion.